along with me if you know it. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told Him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? And how long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cares for you? And how long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How long since you knew that he would answer you and would keep you the long night through. And how long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the day's worth the living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Okay, tonight, if you would, please open your Bible to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2, please. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. I appreciate your prayers this morning as I preached. And I appreciate all the amens this morning. That's encouraging. Uh, when you preach on something that's sort of controversial, you know, about false prophets, I appreciate that this morning. And I appreciate your prayers tonight for me as well. First Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul tonight has some very special words for the church in Thessalonica. Again, they've been going through some, some uh, rough times, going through some adversity, and Paul's words will encourage them, they'll help them. And they will exhort them, and he has some wonderful words for them. Don't forget, Paul has, of course, faced much persecution himself. And he writes in, uh, this is not our text, but in another verse, 2 Corinthians 11, 24-25, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. So Paul is saying, uh, you know, Thessalonians, I know what you're going through, uh, and I want to help you uh, by giving you some words tonight. So he does that. Paul says, I've been there, I've done that, and I've got the scars to prove it. And so Paul's words to the Thessalo Thessalonians are not words of an inexperienced man. They're words of a man who's been through uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a life, gone through a lot for the Lord, suffered greatly uh, for him and so uh, for, for the Lord. So, so Paul's words are not just words from a man of God. They're words from, from a man of experience. And I don't know about you, but I, I want, if somebody's going to help me, I want somebody who's been there and done that to help me. I don't want a, I don't want a single man telling me how to be a good husband. I don't want a man who doesn't have any children telling me how to be a good daddy. I was in a church one time, and a guest preacher was there, and uh, I'll never forget the title of his message was this, uh, Home Improvement, or, 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 yeah, Home Improvement Family Style. Here was a man who was single, didn't have a wife, didn't have any children, and he's going to tell me how to improve my family? No thanks. Uh, I don't want somebody who's not a mechanic working on my car. I don't want someone who's not a doctor cutting me open, amen? Paul's words are not just words that should go in one ear and out the other. No, they're words of an experienced man. He's gone through abuse. He's, uh, he's been shipwrecked. He's been, he's been stripped. He's been striped. And he's been shunned. And so his words are words of experience. He's been there. He's done that. He's got the scars to prove it. So he's going to give them tonight some encouragement. And some help. Look in verse 17, please. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. 
Paul says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And I want to speak tonight on this, this thought, this subject, down but not out. Down but not out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again tonight for a great day you've given to us already. We had good music today. We've had a good spirit tonight and this morning. Had a good service already. And God, I pray now you may take the, the few words I say in the next few moments and please add your touch and your power to them. And God, let this message uh, be a help to us, an encouragement to us as we realize that the words of Paul tonight are words of an experienced man, words of a man who's been through uh, much for the cause of Christ. He's, he's been there, and God has got the scars to prove it. So let us take his testimony, his words, and apply them to our hearts and lives so we, when we face rough times, when we face uh, problems, we may also be able to continue serving God. So help us tonight, I pray, as some of us are down, but we're not out. Help us, Lord, tonight. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Down, but not out. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but as I read through the book of 1 Thessalonians, I, I really get the idea that Paul, he really wants to be a help to this church. And he really wants to be a help to the Thess Thessalonian city and uh, he, he's, been through, he's been through quite a, quite a tough time. He's been through both prosecution and persecution. But his mind and his heart, he still wants to help the church. Especially this church. He was down. But with the desire to help these Thessalonians, he was not out. And tonight I just have two things for us to think about as Paul was down but not out. First of all, in verse 17, down in verse 18, notice that Paul gives us a place of reality. A place of reality. Look in verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time. Paul realizes, listen, I've been taken from you. I've gone through, uh, I've gone through a lot for the cause of Christ. I've been, I've been arrested. I've been taken out of here. I've, been, I've had these things happen to me. So it's, it's reality. It's happened. There's no sense in pouting over it. There's no sense in trying to wish it never happened. There's no sense in trying to, to worry about it. Paul is making the best of a bad situation situation rather than griping about it. Nowhere does Paul ever say, oh, woe is me. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm in this situation. I wish it was somebody else. Nowhere does he ever say, I don't deserve what's happened to me. He just takes it and he, and he, and he, and he takes and makes the best of a bad situation. And he's kind of encouraging the Thessalonians to do the same thing. Make the best of a bad situation. I've heard this phrase, bloom where you're planted. Wherever God has you, he, he's got Paul, he's got Paul in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place he doesn't want to be. But Paul says, I'm just going to make the best of this. I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I may be down, but I'm not out. And, and I thought about this tonight. Sometimes we just need to face reality. Things aren't always going to go our way. Uh, there's going to be de a, a bad days in our life. Have you realized that yet? There's going to be at least one or two bad days out of the week, maybe four or five, six or seven. Listen, there'll probably never be eight bad days in your week, okay? There may be seven, but not eight. And uh, it feels like it sometimes, that's right. And so why should we live in denial? Why should we say, I'm never going to have a bad day? Why should we say, I'm never going to ever be disappointed? Why should we say, I'm never going to have anything come against me? Now, we realize now, now most of the youth today are taught everything's always going to be good. You're always going to get a trophy. All you got to do is just show up. You can strike out every time and you'll get a trophy. Uh, that's the way kids are being raised nowadays, and, and it's society's fault. So we might as well just realize that there's going to be bad day. Paul gives us the place of reality. We might as well just bloom where we're planted. Listen to what Paul talks about in verse 17. He, he talks about his distance from Thessalonica. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, look at what he says, in presence. Uh, he said, I'm not with you now. 
I want to be with you. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. But he's no longer with them physically in Thessalonica. He, he's, not, he's not present with them. He wants to be with them, but he's been forced to leave. That phrase in verse 17 where Paul says, being taken from you, here's what that means. It means literally being bereaved or torn away. Paul's saying this, they've taken me from you. I was there with you. I helped you in your church. And they've come and they've taken me from you. But oh, listen, I want to be with you. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I want to, I, I want to be there to help you and pray for you. But he's been, he's been taken away, being taken away from you, Paul says. But it's just for a short time. But what he's saying is this, I'm not with you in person, but my heart is with you. I can't physically be with you, but I'm with you, is what he says. His, his distance from Thessalonica. And then notice his devotion to Thessalonica, where he says this, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. Uh, I'm not there physically with you, but, oh, listen, I'm with you. I can't pray with you, but I sure can pray for you. Uh, his devotion to Thessalonica. He's been taken away in presence, but not in heart. And while the Lord may have allowed this separation for a time, uh, Paul's love for them, Paul's devotion to them, Paul's dedication to them has never wavered. Think about this. Here's a church that Paul started... He went into this town, preached the gospel, folks got saved, they began meeting and having church, just like this church began. This church began, and then the people have come in, and by, by the way, trying to stop the work of God, they've taken Paul out. Over in Acts chapter 17, we can read about how this came to pass, uh, how the, they took Paul away. Verse, Acts 17, verse 5, But the Jews which believe not, there's your problem, moved with envy, there's problem number two. Took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out of the people. So these Jews, which believe not, they got all the rednecks in town and they go to this house of Jason where they're having church and they take care of business, they think. And when they found them not... They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. So these rednecks come into town. They're going to make a mess of things. They're going to get these people out of there who have turned the world upside down for Jesus and Paul escapes for his life and he tells them, I want to be with you, but I can't be with you right now, but I'm still going to help you and encourage you and do my best to, to, uh, to pray for you and be a blessing to you. His devotion to Thessalonica. And then notice his desire for them. Endeavored, Paul says, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered him. I believe with all of his heart, Paul is not just giving lip service here. He's not just telling them, well, you know, I want to come see you. I want to be with you. I want to help you, but right now I just can't. You know, sometimes we'll do that. We'll say something to somebody. Oh, give me a call. Uh, text me. Just send me a quick email or, or hit me up on Facebook and we'll get together. We'll say that sometimes. But, and we really don't want to get together. You ever been there or just me? Just me? Okay, fine. Um, I would never do that to you guys, though. Never to y'all, okay? But then, Paul, listen, he's not just saying that. He really has a desire to help them. He, th this, these are like his children, if you will. Here's a church that he started, and uh, they've come in, and now he's, now he's been moved away, and he says, I want to be with you, I, I, and I endeavor, I desire to want to be with you and help you, but he says, but I just, I just can't right now. But the devil has put a roadblock in front of him. 
The word desire in verse 17, it's a, it's a zeal, a longing, or a strong passion. Paul's been forced to leave, but yet he still has a passion and a desire to go back to this church and help them and to be a blessing to them. He still has a desire to want to help people. And think about this. I wonder if you and I, well, I more wonder if I, if I had been mistreated the way Paul had been mistreated, would I still have a desire to want to go back and help? I don't know. I've never been there. I've not been mistreated yet. Do we possess the same zeal Paul had? If things don't go our way, are we still, still willing to to be a blessing to people like Paul was? If you got put in prison or kicked out of town or shipwrecked or striped or, or beaten or had anything, would you still have a desire to want to help somebody else? Or would your concern be me? Paul says, I'm not with you right now. I want to be. I've been taken away from you in, in presence but not in heart. I want to help you. I want to bless you. I want to be a, a, an encouragement to you. Listen, Paul was down, but Paul was not out. Notice his deterrence. Here's what he says. But Satan hindered us. As you think about the history of this church at Thessalonica, don't you just know that God in heaven looked down at their work and saw what they were doing, and uh, I don't know if Paul ever, uh, if God ever gives anybody a round of applause, but, but I think God looked down and said, man, you church, you're doing such a good job, and I want to, I want to applaud you for that. I want to, I want to praise you for that. But, and so you know God knows all of their works, but can I say to you, guess who else knows what's going on? The devil does. And the devil did not like it one single bit that this church was going on for God. And he sure didn't like it that Paul was doing a good work for God. So, so Paul here acknowledges that it was Satan who hindered him. It was Satan who tried to strike out Paul. It was Satan who tried to stop the work of God. It was Satan who tried to get Paul not just down but out. Here's what he says, but Satan hindered us. He didn't say Satan has stopped us. He says, Satan has hindered us. And the problem with us sometimes is, while Satan wants to stop the work of God, and Satan wants to stop you from serving God, and Satan wants to stop your family from being close to God, uh, too many times he's successful and he stops us. While we understand there's going to be times when he, he hinders us, he throws roadblocks in the way, he causes things to happen. Oh, listen, we can be down, but we don't have to be out. Paul says, I was down, but I am not out. Satan has only hindered me, he hasn't stopped me. The devil is not one single bit happy at Paul's accomplishments. And can I say to you, anything you've done for God, Satan does not like it one single bit. I think about vacation Bible school this past week. Boy, don't you know Satan had a bad week? <laughs> Boy, we had a good week. But Satan had a bad week. And there were things that could have happened last week behind the scenes that we know nothing about. Uh, but don't you know Satan tried to hinder that last week? Satan tried to put a stop to that. I'm sure some of the kids woke up and uh, didn't want to get on that bus, Brother Martin, come to vacation Bible school. Listen, I'm sure some of the workers woke up and didn't want to come to vacation Bible school. Can I get a witness? They all said amen. Good night. Satan tried to stop that. Listen, we may have been down, but we're not out. Paul says, I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I'm down right now, but I am not out. Let me give you an illustration. If you like baseball, say amen. amen. Some of you did. That's good. Uh, in case you didn't know that, I'm sort of fond of baseball. And uh, Satan here, I can imagine him, he keeps throwing Paul some curveballs. And Paul keeps fouling them off. Strike one. Strike two. And maybe Satan says, I got him. I'm going to throw my fancy pitch. I'm going to throw him the pitch that nobody has ever hit. 
I'm going to throw him some discouragement. I'm going to throw him some, some, uh, some laziness. I'm going to throw him some envy. I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw him some anger for a situation. I'm going to throw this at him, and this time I'm going to strike him out. And he hurls that pitch in there. Guess what Paul does? Home run. He was down to two strikes, though. Curveball, curveball. And here comes Satan's favorite pitch. And he slings it down there. And hoping the umpire would say, strike three. But no, Paul gets a hit. He was down, but he has not struck out. And can I say to you, maybe somebody tonight is down to strike number two. It may be 0 and 2. Not full count, but 0 and 2. No balls, two strikes. And maybe he's been throwing you some discouragement. Maybe he's been throwing you some anger or some bitterness or some hurt feelings, or some laziness, and, and you keep fouling off those pitches, can I say to you, he wants to strike you out. He wants to strike you out more than Nolan Ryan wants to strike you out. Uh, he's got a pitch in his arsenal that he thinks you can't hit. He's going to throw it to you time after time after time. And can I say to you, he wants to hinder you. He wants to stop you. He wants to get you down and out. But can I say to you, by the grace of God, with Paul as our example, we can be down, but we don't have to be out. Amen. The place of reality, Paul says, it's going to happen. You're going to be hindered. You're going to, be, you're going to have problems. You're going to have bad days. God, uh, Satan wants to stop the work of God. He wants to cause you to have, uh, lose your joy. He wants you to doubt your salvation. He wants you to stop the work of God. He wants you to give up on church and give up on Him. That's what He wants you to do. He's got you down 0-2 maybe, but you don't have to be out. Paul said it's going to happen. The place of reality, but also in verse 19 and verse 20, there's a place of rejoicing. Listen to what he says. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? He doesn't say we don't have any hope. He says, what is it? And here's what he says it is. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For Paul says, for ye are our glory and joy. When I played baseball, I didn't like having two strikes on me. I Especially didn't like 0 2, no balls, two strikes, because then the coach says you got to not swing as hard, just try to put the ball in play. I didn't like just putting the ball in play, I liked hitting them way out yonder. There's no reason to be happy, physically speaking, when you're down to two strikes. Uh, Paul says, Yes, we're down. And yes, he's throwing us curveballs. And yes, he's tried to hinder the work of God. But Paul says, I've still got a reason to rejoice. I've still got a reason to count my blessings. I've still got a reason to, to be happy in God. Notice his pondering. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Paul realized, listen, uh, he can keep on going for God because look at what he's already done. Look at the blessings God's already given him. Listen, for his whole ministry, he's always been in trouble. He's always had people after him. He's always had bad days. Paul maybe has never had seven straight days of no, no issues. His pondering, for what is our hope? He says this, what keeps us going? What gives us our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? What's the reason we can rejoice in God even though bad things are going to happen? Here's what he says, I've got you all as, uh, as, as my fruit, is what he's saying. Maybe he says this, when I think about what I'm going through for God, when I think about the suffering, and when I think about giving up, or throwing in the towel, I look back at the church at Thessalonica, and I see here's, a, here's, a, here's a, someone who was saved. Here's someone who heard the gospel and got saved. Here's somebody who's a part of a church. Here's somebody who's growing in God. And Paul says, you are our joy and our rejoicing. You're the reason we continue. You're the reason we do what we do. You're the reason we're able and willing to suffer for God because you are our rejoicing. He says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Think about, think about looking from the outside in. Looking at Paul's life, it may seem like his ministry was a failure. Work with me here. 
People may look at Paul and say, listen, Paul, you, you've, uh, you've given your life to Jesus Christ. And you've committed your life to Him. Uh, you've told Him, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And so God sent, has sent you, Paul, to this city to start a church. And uh, you've had all these things happen. As a matter of fact, if we read through our Bible, we realize only about three months in Thessalonica, and they kicked Him out. So people may say, Paul, why do you do that? Why do you set yourself up for failure? Why do you keep going through the hard times and going through both the prosecution and the persecution? What's the reason for your, what's the method of your madness? Why do you do what you do? And, and how can you still do it with a smile on your face, Paul? And Paul says, well, because Thessalonica, they are our glory and our joy. They're the reason I do what I do, Paul says. He reminds them there's plenty of reasons to be happy in the Lord. Happiness is not based upon your situation. His pondering, notice his peace in verse 19 and 20. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not ye even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Paul says, don't feel sorry for me. Don't worry about me. Don't, uh, don't, don't say, oh, woe is Paul. Paul says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm rejoicing. I've got peace in my heart. He says, because you Thessalonians, when the Lord comes, you're going to go with him. You've been saved. And when the rapture comes, you're going to go with him. I've got peace because of that. Oh, yes, I've had some bad days. And yes, I've been through some stuff that you would not even believe. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been put away. I've almost been killed for the cause of Christ but I can still have peace because what I have done with God's help has been successful because you guys have heard the gospel and you've been saved and now you're ready for heaven. That's my joy. That's my crown of rejoicing. I wonder, would we go through that to see somebody saved? We think we've done something. We'll be knocked on 179 doors in one day. We think we've done something. But here's a man, Paul, who was... I believe, possibly even murdered. No doubt persecuted. No doubt kicked out of every town he went to. No doubt had folks talk about him and mistreat him. And he just kept on going because what he was doing was successful. Notice in verse 20, his prophet. Satan hindered him. Satan wanted to defeat him. Satan wanted to win. But guess who won? Paul did. Paul had two strikes on him. I mean, he was down. He, he, the Satan thought, I got him. I'm going to give him this old, this nasty. Uh, you know, you have pitches of number one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to give him number ten. I mean, it's nasty. I'm going to throw it to him. He ain't no way he's going to hit it. I've got this game wrapped up. This game is my game. I'm winning. I'm ahead in the game, and I'm fixing to strike out God's best hitter. And I'm going to throw him something nasty he ain't never seen before. Can I say ain't in church? I don't have. Uh, he ain't never seen one like this before. I mean, I'm going to wind up. You remember the Bugs Bunny commercial where he winds up his arm like this? He picks his leg up, and he throws it down there. And, and the devil says, I got one for him here. He's not going to hit this one. And lo and behold, he throws it with all of his might. Arm slinging, you know, leg up. And, then, and Paul says, here comes the pitch. And I can hear the announcers in the stadium. Here comes the pitch. The devil winds up. He slings the ball down to the plate. And here's the pitch. That's the ball hitting the bat. And there it goes out of the park. Satan thought he had him. Paul says, Oh, I was hindered. I was down. But I did not strike out. His prophet. He'd reached souls for Jesus Christ. The game, you see, wasn't just temporal. The game was eternal. And Paul says, I was down. Oh, yeah, I was down. I was down 0-2. He says, but I got a hit. I hit the ball, I ran fast, and I scored. 
Satan ever told you, you know, why do you do what you do? Why in the world would you come back to church on a Sunday night? He was in church all morning. Why in the world would you come back on a Tuesday 30 minutes early? Why in the world would you come back early on Sunday afternoon and have to quit your nap time early to come to choir practice? Why would you take time out of your week to volunteer for vacation Bible school? We didn't pay any of us. Why in the world would you get out of bed early on a Sunday morning and get on that bus and go pick up children? Why in the world would you take time on Saturday to study a Sunday school lesson, to be able to teach your Sunday school lesson on Sunday morning? Why would you take time out of your busy day to do things like that? Why do you do what you do for God, especially when you've had a bad day, especially when you're down 0-2? Why would you do that? Satan never said, I've got you now because I've got you wondering, why in the world do you do that? They asked Paul, why do you do that? Why don't you just enjoy the rest of your life? Why don't you just retire and go lay on the beach somewhere and uh, just enjoy the rest of your life? Paul says, well, I really can't. Because those Thessalonians, they still need me. Satan's hindered me. He's got me down 0-2, but I haven't struck out yet. Can I say to you, there's a reward coming one day. It may not be down here. God may bless us down here. We may have people pat us on the back and say, you're doing a good job. But these rewards down here are just temporary. There's a day of coming when God's going to say, hopefully, well done. You were down 0-2. Satan had you down, O2. He threw everything you had at you, and you didn't strike out. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let me close by reading these verses. Let me say this. Even though we face adversity, we may be hindered, maybe down, O2. We're not out. Romans 8, 35 and following says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Nay, Paul says, that means no way. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through, Christ, uh, through him that loved us. Paul says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even when the counts O2, God still loves us. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10 says this, We are troubled on every side, Paul says, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Romans 8.18 says this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul says, You may be down, but you're not out. Down, but not out. Please stand, we'll pray. 